Counting at two. The recruits are in position and ready. The question is, are we ready? I only hope our teleportation room is big enough to contain this monster. And strong enough too, sir. Teleportation in 30 seconds. Like a grand and miraculous spaceship, our planet has sailed through the universe of time. And for a brief moment, we have been among its many passengers. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> as you can see, we'll be on the ground soon. Everything's all right now, but uh, that was a close call. Actually, the chances are a million to one against meeting another emergency like that. So please fly with us another time. There's a lot more to see on Mars. Let's, let's get this show on the road! <laughs> We're on our way, my friend! W, w Radio. Your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 254 for the week of December 25th, 2011. I'll open up the inbox this week and answer more of your questions about your Walt Disney World vacation plans, history, tips, advice, and more. Some of the topics we'll cover this week include the opening of the new Fantasyland, tips for adults in the Magic Kingdom, guests with special needs, a Tron attraction, a four-day trip plan, tours for the entire family, some history and trivia about a themed restaurant that's long been closed, and a question for you about bringing back some classic extinct attractions. I'll have a couple of announcements, including more information about our WDW Radio events during next month's Walt Disney World Marathon Weekend, and then I'll play a few more of your voicemails at the end of the show. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. One of the aspects of the show that I enjoy so much is hearing from you and helping to address and answer some of your personal, individual questions that quite often are being asked by many others as well. And this helps make the show a two-way conversation, as well as hopefully continuing to enhance your experiences and your appreciation for Walt Disney World during your next visit. And helping me once again to answer your email questions is the Janus to my Dr. Teeth, the Apollo to my Rocky, the Pat Morita to my Ralph Macchio, the Tonto to my Lone Ranger, the Tennille to my captain. She is, of course, Becky Menken from MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, the recommended travel pro provider to my WDW radio. How, how do I possibly follow that up? But, but I do have to ask, didn't Apollo die? Well, he, he was... <laughs> You are the, the Bullwinkle to my Rocky. How's that? Instead of wow. the Apollo to my Rocky. Is that in height size or is that? Oh, you see? You, know, you had to start Sorry. off right off the... <laughs> right I couldn't like help that. it. I couldn't help it. You stepped right into that one. Listen, all I know is pretty much all of those references, for the most part, show how old I really am. Because kids right now <laughs> are Googling Bullwinkle and Rocky and Tennille That's and Captain. That's very true. I'll, I'll take the Tennille and Captain one. That's that's good. That's you good. see how I spent my evenings uh, as a child uh, in front of the TV. <laughs> but, Becky, listen, we have got a ton of emails to get to, and I always start off by apologizing. I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to apologize anyway because we've got so many in the queue that we want to get to. And like I said, a lot of these questions oftentimes are, are very personal to people's upcoming uh, trips or experiences, but oftentimes represent a lot of general questions that we get from people as well. So let's dive right into it. And hopefully I did not put a food question first to uh, to step into the normal trap that I always do. But the first one does come Alicia, who is AK Disney Girl 88 when she watches live in the box. And Alicia says, hey, Lou, I was thinking of planning a Disney trip next year 
and would love to try and tie in a, the grand opening of the new Fantasyland. I was just wondering if you heard when the official grand opening will take place. I know you said on a Wednesday night that there was a rumor about them possibly opening Storybook Circus in February or March. Thanks for all that you do. I used to think I knew a lot about Disney, but you showed me there are more ways to learn and do so. Have a very magical day and or night. So, Becky, a, a lot of us, as we approach the new year, have already circled pretty much spring and summer 2012 <laughs> because, again, it is a very exciting time to be a Disney fan out in California. We've got Cars Land out here. We have Art of Animation, and more importantly, we have the opening of Fantasyland. And Alicia's right. It seems that uh, although Disney has not specifically mentioned a certain day or a certain weekend, we are understanding that February 2012 is when Storybook Circus is going to begin to open. Uh, they did mention in a Mickey Monitor uh, about a month or so ago that they did sort of confirm February 2012. Now we're hearing the first or second week, and my understanding is that Storybook Circus may open also not completely uh, finalized, but at least one of the dueling Dumbos is going to be open at that time. Oh, that's going to be so terrific to see these new things come online. It's been so anticipated for everything that's coming, like you said, not only in Fantasyland, but over in California as well. Um, I had heard rumor, as you did, about the February-March scenario, but obviously... I'm so focused on the whole spring, summer, more to the summer of 2012. It's a lot of rumor, and uh, you hear one thing one day and another thing another day. So hopefully what you're saying is, is accurate because I'll, I'll be there during that first couple of weeks of February. So that would be great. And I understand for people who are trying to plan their vacations, it makes yeah. it difficult because you are starting to get close and people are already thinking about ADRs. There's your food tie-in. But I think it also is good because I would hate for them to say, okay, it's going to open February 9th and then something happens, the weather gets bad, they can't finish something, and then people make the reservations and they can't open it on time. I'd rather have them sort of specify time as they get closer. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I know that we get a little rambunctious and we want the information and we want to plan our vacations. But, but like you said, a lot of the construction phases are dependent upon the weather. So I, it would be very disappointing for them to give us dates and then, of course, not be able to hold up to it. Yeah, and I can tell you, uh, getting a chance to go to the Magic Kingdom probably at least once a week or so. Construction You're it is in again. moving. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> For you, I'm there to, to ah. try and share what's going on. Construction is moving along at a very, very rapid pace. The, the The new landscape, both horizontally and vertically, is really coming together, and it's spectacular to look at as you sort of stand by the Seven Dwarfs Mine or uh, over by um, uh, the old location of Mrs. Potts or, or Winnie the Pooh. You can really look across and see just how expansive Fantasyland is, and I've I've been through the parks with guests who haven't been here in a long time, and they see it, and it's breathtaking. And what I love most about it, Becky, is not just again we've got we've gotten this expansion of Fantasyland, which because right now Fantasyland for the most part is a midway and expands it not only horizontally but vertically as well. You get the mountain range, you get the castles off in the distance. It goes very very far back, but I love the water features. I love the fact that there's going mm -hmm. to be. Uh, you know, a river and there's going to be waterfalls, a lot of kinetic elements there beyond the attractions themselves. Uh, the Fantasyland forest is going to be very lush, very green, and it's just going to be spectacular when it opens. You know, I have to say that I kind of step back from it and I haven't been looking at all of those details because I, I almost want to uh, come into it with fresh eyes and not having to, having seen a lot of the, uh, um, the drawings that have been done recently. I, I kind of want to just be surprised by it all it uh and again i i too like i'm the same kind of person i don't like watch videos of things before i go and experience them personally but as you walk through the parks again it's breathtaking it's going to be very interesting to see in january when dumbo closes how uh getting through Fantasyland, sort of navigating that section of the center of Fantasyland is going to be i can tell you that uh living as close as i do to walt disney world i actually saw a couple of tractor trailers last week with some of the new Dumbo's uh, ride vehicles wow. going into the very Magic cool. Kingdom. And they're beautiful. The The color palette is very different. So the new Dumbo is going to be the one that's going to open up first. And the second one, which I assume is the current Dumbo, is going to be refreshed, repainted, given the new color scheme. And that, that'll be added later on, hopefully uh, in time for the summer when the rest of, of the new Fantasyland opens. Exciting. 
Very much, very much. So anyway, let's move on. Another question. This comes from Laura, the newly registered Elderby on the forums. And she says, Lou, I, like virtually all of your faithful listeners, am Disney obsessed. My first trip to the world happened in 1979 at the age of one. I don't remember that trip, but my family tells me from that moment on, Disney was it for me. Being originally from Florida, I grew up on making annual trips to the parks, and this continued even after moving to Georgia. However, as I planned for this year's upcoming trip, I realized that it's been over 10 years since I visited the Magic Kingdom. Laura, you're in for a surprise. I'll be going down soon and taking my mother with me, and not only will this this be the first time that we've been to this specific park in over 10 years, but it'll be the first time that either one of us has been to the Magic Kingdom without any children. And so Becky, Laura's question is, what do adults do in the Magic Kingdom? We plan on going on every possible ride, of course, but I was wondering if there's anything that you suggest that we do that's more adult-oriented and that we could arrange with only six weeks or so advance notice. Thanks again. That's Laura. Uh, Becky, I'm going to give you first crack at this. I'm very interested to see you here. What well. you would recommend for adults. And just remember, Gaston's Tavern does not serve alcohol. Go. Oh, darn. Well, okay. <laughs> Neither for does me, Tortuga Tavern. So. Dang it. Anyway, <laughs> what do adults do? For me, it's it's everything. I guess as an adult, I personally appreciate the Magic Kingdom because it's it's giving me the nod to turn into a kid again. So I, I'm not really focused on the adult things because that gives me the, the license to go run around like an eight-year-old, which I love. So I'll ride the fantasy rides with ear to ear grin and, you know, all the associated things that come with that. But, of course, uh, going on all the rides is what it's all about for the Magic Kingdom for the exception of. I also like doing things, and of course this is me because I, I get – I'm blessed with the opportunity to go as often as I do. I do a lot of people watching too because I just enjoy that and uh, taking in the detail because I've been listening to a podcast that tells me that I need to slow down and watch the detail. wonder who that is. Lou. Uh, of course, more adult-oriented, there are the backstage tours, um, the Wishes dessert party you can take in that's available to you. I'm, I keep being drawn back though to not being so focused on being an adult but just letting the eight-year-old inside go crazy. I didn't know that that eight-year-old still existed in you. I, I'm kidding, oh. of course, <laughs> I, I, because, because your answer basically mirrors exactly what I would have said, which is the answer of what adults should do in the Magic Kingdom, especially when you do not bring children with you, is do everything that the kids do. Be yeah. Let yourself be a kid again. Hit the classic attractions and really take the time to experience them on all the sort of different layers of the onion that I that I sort of describe Walt Disney World in. So go on Pirates over and over again and really get a close look at it and, and the Haunted Mansion and, you know, laugh at Splash Mountain and Big Thunder Mountain. Enjoy sort of, again, as having gone there 10 years ago, enjoy things like the Carousel of Progress and the TTA, the changes to attractions like the Hall of Presidents, uh, classics that really haven't changed very much like the Jungle Cruise or a return to some of the classics like the Tiki Room. Yeah, and or I the Carousel right of too. Progress, yeah. which I kind of, I got, kind of got another new appreciation for in the past <laughs> couple of weeks. <laughs> so, and, and two, you can also enhance that experience if you want by doing some additional activities, whether it's a special dessert party, a fireworks cruise, uh, a backstage tour, whatever it might be. But I think... You and your mom should go as you did in 1979. Go with your mom and you. And I think that'll sort of bring back a lot of those memories that you had of going so many years ago. And, you know, that's look, Becky, that's why we love Walt Disney World. It's not about mm-hmm. pirates. It's not about the Haunted Mansion. I think for a lot of people, it's about those memories that we created either with our parents or maybe as parents or with our friends. And I think allowing yourselves to enjoy that time, just the two of you, will really uh, will really make your trip something special. Yeah, I completely agree. I just uh, – that park in particular is the one that just – you know, you walk in the gates and it's, it's yours. It, it's your playground. And, you know, let – like I said, turn back into being a kid again and don't feel guilty and have a great time. And remember, you'll never see those people again, so act as crazy <laughs> as you want to be. There you go. 
Moving on to a question from Katie Maxwell. She says, hi, Lou, and in parentheses, Becky. I'm a huge fan of the show. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you for bringing us Disney fans from the North. The Disney fix that we need while we await our next vacation. You are very welcome. Thank you for listening. I've been to Walt Disney World several times in the past, and each and every time I visit, I love it more and more. This, ne- com- this, <laughs> this coming trip, I convinced my husband to finally go along with me for an entire week of Walt Disney World goodness. Before now, he's only been to Epcot for one day when we were in Florida for Tiger's spring training. I was trying to ease him into the experience as he's always been convinced he won't like Walt Disney World, and yet she stays married to him. Since I want to make this trip as fun as possible for him, I have two questions. First, my husband is 6'6 tall, 6 foot 6 inches tall, and normal weight. I find Space Mountain to be incredibly tight, even for myself, and I'm only 5'9". Katie, I feel your pain. (laughs) Don't laugh. I know that it's slightly tall for a girl, but definitely not 6'6". Before we wait in line, I just have to ask, is he going to fit? I'm sure it sounds like a strange question, but he hates being uncomfortable due to his height. So even though I really want him to experience it, I'm wondering if maybe we should skip it. Second, I'm planning on taking it easy this trip, and I'm not going into my crazy do-everything-see-everything mode. He's really into relaxation on his vacations, and with him not sure about Disney, I wouldn't want to scare him just yet. We're staying at Coronado Springs for my very first time, and I really know nothing about the resort. Is there anything at the resort we should make sure to take in? I already have some great dining reservations, but how about the Maya Grill? It's one I really haven't heard either way about. Thanks so much for your time. Love the show. Keep up the great work. I appreciate the time you put in to make this show very special. And again, that's from Katie Maxwell. Katie, thank you for your email and such kind words about the show. Let's hit these questions, Becky, one at a time. First questions first. Again, uh, I being five, six and a half on a good day with the right shoes. I cannot appreciate not being able to fit being six, six tall and normal weight. But what I can tell you is that you have a very legitimate question and concern, but Disney definitely addresses that for you. And actually, if you go back to show number 103, that's from January 25th of 2009, we did an entire show about going to Walt Disney World. And I put special needs in quotes because believe it or not, uh, height and weight um, concerns are in fact special needs and we do address that and what you'll find by listening to that show is that a lot of the attractions will give you a chance to try out the vehicle beforehand or get a chance to talk to the cast members ahead of time so i know things like mission space astro orbiter space mountain uh, even splash mountain some people uh, sometimes have concerns so i, I would just, i believe you're going to fit it is going to be snug you may have a tough time with his knees but if you talk to a cast member before you get in line on a lot of the attractions, they may have a vehicle like over at Expedition Everest. There's a seat that you can try there, just like over at Test Track as well. And the cast members should be able to assist you with that before you even you know, wait in line for potentially a long time. Right. And I was going to say, at the first part, which she was talking about the height, I was thinking, man, she's asking the wrong people on this one. <laughs> only only because bo- neither of us are that tall. So, But I, I think you're right. Like an airline seat, he may be a bit cramped, but should fit. But it's a really good suggestion to, to give it a try to make sure that you're going to be comfortable or as comfortable as you possibly can be at 6'6". Yeah, I have some friends who are taller than 6'6". When we walk down Main Street together, we look like the partner statue. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, they too, they've expressed concern, but they've told me that they've, they're pretty much able to ride everything. If you don't mind being maybe a little bit cramped or sort of having your knees uh, sort of up to your chest as you're riding. But again, also talk to the cast member ahead of time before you ride the attraction, before you get in line. Second question, Becky, she's staying over at Coronado Springs for her first time. She doesn't really know anything about the resort. Why don't you go ahead and, and give us some of your impressions of Coronado and your thoughts? You know what? The neat thing about Coronado that I'm hearing, and this this is something you and I have talked about several times, that we really need to get back over there and take a look because they've done a lot of upgrades, especially to the rooms. They've done some great things from what I hear to the rooms there. But one of the things I really do enjoy about Walt Disney World is the different resorts that have different themes and different experiences. And so many times people will arrive to, to Disney World and get up and hit the parks and they go to the parks from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. and then they don't really have a lot of time to experience the resort. So I'm very encouraged to see that she's 
uh, kind of looking at a little bit of relaxation time at the resort itself because there's a lot of things to do there. Obviously, the pool there gets rave reviews. It is one of the – it's very spread out. It's very large, and it has a, a lot of, uh, of great feedback. But a couple other things you can do, too, at the resort. I haven't tried the Maya Grill in some time myself, but it's about food, so I'm sure you'll be able to chime in on that in a second. <laughs> but they do have a great health club that does have some um, – some spa treatments, some massage treatments that you can go for if you want a little relaxation. And there's also a lot of different activities like um, the the bike rentals, the Surrey bike rentals that are there. The property at Coronado is rather large and spread out. You can uh, kind of take a, a little bit of time to enjoy some of those types of recreational activities there as well. Yeah, and the first and foremost thing I want to say about Coronado is I think that it is one of the resorts – that oftentimes may get a bit of a, a bad rap. And by that, mm-hmm. I mean Coronado Resort, Coronado Springs is often referred to as a convention or the convention resort because it does have a large convention facility there. But that being said, it is so far removed from the resort itself that you don't get that sense at all. Um, there's you know 200,000 plus square feet of convention space, but it's not plopped right in the middle of Lago Dorado. It's off to the side. So you really don't get a sense of it, except maybe if you go into Maya Grill or to the Pepper Market for dinner. During convention time, you may find some people in business suits when it's 137 degrees outside. That being (laughs) said, I think Coronado Springs is one of the most beautifully themed resorts and gives you that sense of being somewhere else. It it has that very deep Southwest-themed feel to it. And there are even a number of different styles of buildings. So there are the casitas, which means like little houses. There are the ranchos, which are two and three story uh, kind of Pueblo styled villas. And there also uh, are the cabanas as, as well. The other thing about Coronado Springs is, like you said, Becky, the amenities there are wonderful. It surrounds Lago Dorado, which is a huge 22 area, uh, acre lake. There is a... Um, uh, a, a huge pool in the middle called the Dig Site. It's got this giant Mayan pyramid, 123-foot-long water slide. There's a playground out there as well. There's lots of other uh, activities for adults and kids. There's a huge hot – there's a 22-person hot tub there. Nobody talks wow. about the hot tub. Um, <laughs> and, of course, there's a number of great restaurants. You mentioned the Maya Grill, which is a sit-down, kind of a fine dining restaurant. I ate there a few months ago. Really enjoyed it. Again, it's very much off people's radar. The Pepper Market uh, is a quick service restaurant, but now they're actually experimenting with making that a different style of buffets. There's a cantina. And I'll tell you, Becky Mankin, that you probably don't know or have ever been to one of sort of the little secret hotspots and hideaways for adults, which is Rick's Lounge. It's it's a sort of Mediterranean-inspired lounge that uh, has uh, a bar. It's got dancing. It's got TVs. Uh, has um, some bar food there as well. Very much out of the way. Really something very different uh, energy-wise than you'll find anywhere else probably on property. Uh, I'm very much in the moderate level a fan of the Port Orleans resorts, but Coronado is very, very close behind it, and I've stayed there a number of times. And I know that my kids really enjoyed it, again, specifically because of uh, the dig site and the feature pool there. Yeah, and another thing, too, that's unique because it is a moderate resort, but unique to this resort is that they do also have junior suites and one-bedroom suites in the casita. So uh, there's other types of rooms besides just the standard moderate room that you, you'll you get uh, at the rest of property. So there's a little bit of variety for families especially. And so here's your trivia question of the day. No. Who or what <laughs> was Coronado Springs named after? Stop uh, Googling. Stop Googling <laughs> and dinging. Put down the Android device. Dang, really? I have no idea. Let me get the overview Don on my... Francisco de Coronado. And what was he searching for? What was he searching for? What was his Spain. Legendary... <laughs> no, he, he wasn't searching for the hot tub. He was searching for the seven cities of gold. Uh, is that so what it was? Go. Were you with him? Just checking. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah. I um, love the resort, love the pool. That sort of Mayan theme is is uh, is very very cool. And again, the nice thing too is you know just because you're not staying at the resort, it doesn't mean you can't go exploring. So if you've never stayed there, you can go and check out 
the lobby and the pool areas and even go eat there and sort of wander the, the property. It's beautiful at night. Walking around uh, Lago Dorado at night is really, really nice. Very sort of one of those quiet, relaxing things you can do. Um, there's hammocks out there as well, too. So really, really like Coronado Springs as well. But we'll have to do a full review sometime in the future. That sounds like a great idea. There you go. All right. Next question is from West Babylon, New York. I sound like uh, Larry King. West Babylon, you're on the air. Chris D'Onofrio says, <laughs> hey, Lou. That was the worst Larry King ever. Uh, love the show. Sounded like my Maury Amsterdam, just wasn't that the whole <laughs> <laughs> Will you hear me do my James Mason? I just started oh, listening boy. a month ago and I cannot stop. I'm 29 years old. I've been to Walt Disney World every year of my life, sometimes twice. As a child, Chris, I like you already. I was a fan of the first Tron film. I saw the newest film, Tron Legacy, in the theater three times and have watched it numerous times on DVD. So here is my multi part question. One, did Disney ever have plans to turn the original film into an attraction oh so many years ago? Given the technology, this is the second question, given the technology today and the unbelievable world that film created, do you think Disney will ever make a Tron Legacy a ride attraction? And three, if they ever did make a Tron attraction, which park, obviously not Animal Kingdom, do you think it would best fit in? Thanks so much for your time. Again, that's Chris D'Onofrio. Chris, I dig this question because I'm a huge, huge Tron fan. Becky Mankin. No way. Really? Have you seen Tron and have you seen Tron Legacy? You know what? I did. Both? Both. Back to back even because you yelled at me for not seeing Tron before. <laughs> so we waited until till Tron Legacy came out and we watched, watched him back to back. So it, it, I was pretty impressed. So let's get to Chris's question. Did Disney ever, ever have plans to turn the original film into an attraction so many years ago? No, but they, there were plans for a Tron arcade in Disney in Disneyland in uh, Epcot Center. So again, remember, timing, early to mid-80s, that's where me and the rest of the geeks spent all our time we were in arcades, and they were going to have sort of a, a Flynn's arcade there, which of course never came to be. They did put a Flynn's Arcade out in Disneyland for Electronica, which I've unfortunately not gotten a chance to see. But given the technology today and the unbelievable world they created, do I think they'll ever make a Tron Legacy attraction? Chris, this was actually an idea that I have. So as I wander through uh, the parks, I often sort of wonder about what's next. You you, you think, look at, at spaces, you sort of dream about your favorite films being made into an attraction. And if you go into Tomorrowland and the Magic Kingdom in between Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress and Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger Spin is currently a meet and greet area but there's a large uh, tall wall there which used to uh, be the location of the Galaxy Palace Theater that was where they used uh, they would have high school bands come in there and, and performances they used it oftentimes for Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party that's where they had the Once Upon a Christmas Time show Becky here's my idea Go with me here. Uh, I can't wait. Uh -huh. They make that. <clears throat> they make that area. <clears throat> a portal. So one of those portals that Imagineers use throughout the parks that transport you from one place to another. And as you venture through that portal, you are deposited into the game grid of Tron. And in that little area back there, you can have this virtual world of being on the grid. You can have a virtual reality light cycle so every kid dreamed about riding on a light cycle you can have this virtual reality type light cycle attraction a discs of tron type um, experience you can have the end of line bar upstairs uh, there's a lot of great possibilities so to and it, it fits perfectly into the theme of tomorrowland uh, i think the tron franchise is certainly not dead because you you notice that uh the way the film ended <clears throat> It did leave it open. There is supposedly going, according to Bruce Boxleitner, there is going to be a Tron 3. There's also going to be um, a Tron series on TV. I know many people want to bring back Olivia Wilde, who played Korra. But I think <laughs> that that fantasy world of being in the Tron universe and sort of that walking through that portal in Tomorrowland fits in that section perfectly. Okay, I have a question for you. Because you were just talking about the portal being transported. Mm -hmm. Totally, I'm going to go off. I'm going off the grid for a moment. But did you ever experience the Star Trek attraction at the Hilton in Las Vegas? We used to call it Star Trek, 
the experience oh, match Star Trek. Seriously, <laughs> Sorry. Really? Well, are you going to hit me with that? Really? Are you going to? I that? love. I, mean, I, do, I am a huge Star Trek and Star Wars geek. So I used to go out uh, with my dad and my brother every year to Las Vegas, January. and uh-huh. would uh, the the you couldn't imagine how they shoehorned such a huge attraction in right. that section of the Hilton, where you walked through that sort of virtual museum. You were literally transported, pardon the pun, onto the bridge of the that's, Next Generation Enterprise. That's the part that I'm pointing out. Is it remember when you walked in onto the transporter pad and you had nothing but what you had walked into and then you were instantly transported to the bridge. You blinked and you were on the bridge of the Enterprise. Do you remember I that do. feeling yep. this time? That would be a cool thing if they could if they could replicate that and putting you onto the game grid. Yeah, you get derezzed and you dropped onto the grid excuse me, and you enter a completely new world right inside of Tomorrowland. We need to build a theme park. <laughs> I, listen, I, I, I dig it. The, the sea of simulation. So There you go. I like it. I like it. So uh, I would love to hear from listeners what they think about that, what they liked about the idea of either a Tron attraction, a Tron little uh, grid area like that where they would put it. You can comment in this week's show notes over at wdwradio.com. And we're going to move on to the next question, who is it's from Hannah, a.k.a. ginormous Disney fanatic. She says, hey, Lou, I'm a huge fan of the podcast, and it's my favorite way to get excited for my upcoming trips to the most magical place on Earth. My boyfriend and I have been dating for three years now, going to be taking our fourth trip to Walt Disney World in December. We're going to be celebrating Christmas in Walt Disney World, and I want to get him a Disney-themed gift. I've already given him the Walt Disney World trivia books for a previous birthday and photos galore. I'm all out of fun ideas that say, I love you, while still being Disney-related. Lou, please help me out. You're my only hope. I just threw that (laughs) Star Wars reference in there. I'd really love to make this memorable and special. Thanks for all your help and keep up the great work. Sincerely, Hannah. Hannah, nothing says I love you like the Celebrations Magazine limited edition hardbound holiday book. Why did I not think that you would go there? Really? I, listen, I had to. Tim yeah. Foster, he, I, but without sort of uh, a self-serving answer, I, I, I do, as a fan, I, I like the holiday book and I can say that because 99.9% of the pictures and articles in there were not written by me. However, gorgeous. Uh, the things that I, I thought about when you talked about giving him a an I love you Disney related gift for the holidays, I thought about simple things like an ornament with your name on it and the year uh, and the date of your trip. Mm-hmm. Nothing says I love you like a like a big old huggable Duffy bear. But but here's my here's my real answer. And it's something that is is for both of you. When you go down to the parks, uh, you get a photo book, a, a photo pass. And what you do is you order a photo pass book of the memories from your trip. So everywhere you go, get photo pass pictures taken. You're not obligated to do anything by getting the, the pictures taken. But when you get home, you can put together a, a bound book and they're beautiful. And it's a great way to sort of remember your time. It's a great sort of gift that you can look back on. And something else I would suggest doing too, if maybe you don't want to just do the photo pass book is if you are staying at one of a couple, and you don't really mention where you're staying, but if you're staying at Grand Floridian, Wilderness Lodge, Animal Kingdom Lodge, or some of the other resorts, you can actually get a free portrait session with a professional photographer. And it's a little bit more elaborate than just the photo pass photographer there. They bring out lighting and cameras and equipment, and uh, they the session is free, but obviously the, the prints cost the normal photo pass rate. But it's a really great way to memorialize your trip and make it uh, something a little bit more special. The only tip I have for you is go before lunch or dinner because you, if you end up wearing some of your food, it's going to ruin your photos. <laughs> and I can't believe you stole my answer. That's, I'm, I'm so bummed right now because I will tell you those photo pass books are gorgeous. And if you, if you don't tell them that you're, um, that you're getting or what you're going to do with the pictures at the end. If you just get the pictures done and you go through the photo pass, you can have this, uh, this book created and shipped. So you've got all those memories and that is a wonderful, wonderful idea. Um, in addition, like you were talking about the, uh, doing a photo session that can be done at the resorts. You can also have the photo sessions in park as well. So there's a lot of opportunities to get a really special picture of, of the two of you together. Um, I was thinking back on, 
because my, my husband's a very big Disney fan, and one of the, the first gifts he ever gave me was a stuffed Tigger for my desk with a little thing that said, I love you. So it's, it's always the thought that counts, too. There's a collective awe from the listening audience. I know, awe. <laughs> <laughs> better than a Duffy. Tigger is better than a Duffy. I don't know, man. Duffy's pretty huggable. Oh, man, there's, there's this. Do we have to start that argument right now? Really? I'm just saying. I, I like bears. Believe, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. Don't don't email. It's okay. I, I can get. I like Duffy. <laughs> I like bears. But uh, all right. For another time. Moving on. Next tweet. Becky Mankin hates Duffy. Anyway, moving on <laughs> to Anthony Lucchese's email. He says, Lou, I am 17 years old. My dad and I are hopefully heading down to Walt Disney World this fall and have a few questions. We're hoping to utilize the free dining offer and travel this December. We've only traveled to the world once before, but we go to Disneyland at least once a year. So his question is this. With only four full days at the parks, how would you suggest we plan our time? We hope to visit all four theme parks, possibly a water park, Disney Quest, the Christmas decorations, insert smiley there, as well as, as much as he despises Universal, the Wizarding World, blah, 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 blah. I fully believe in doing <laughs> one park per day and taking time to slow down and enjoy the parks, but with school and all, we can't extend our stay. So I turn to you. What are your suggestions on how to spend our time? On another question, like most of us, I dream of being an Imagineer. <clears throat> I heard about the dining with the Disney Imagineer. What are your thoughts on this? Anyway, love the show and appreciate your help so much, Anthony. Um, Anthony, you have got a very, um, you, you're Challenge. really, you've got a challenging thing here because you've got a, a pretty um, a, aggressive look at how you want to spend your four days, four theme parks, water park, Disney Quest decorations, and that other place down the road. First things first, cut that one out because you're not going hey. to be able to, whoa, slow down, <laughs> sister. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Cut out the, uh, the, the magical world of Hallie, whatever her name is. Because with four days at the parks, you will need all four days to try and do just the couple of the, just to do the parks themselves. You start throwing in a water park there, as well as Disney Quest, and going to see Christmas decorations, especially if you want to go around the resorts. That's four days. I mean, very easily right there. What you may end up doing, though, depending on when you go, is the water park may potentially be out depending on weather. So if it's too cold. And again, in December, you never know. One day it might be 40, the next day it might be 80, and that is not very much an exaggeration. So if it is on the low end, you may be able to cut out a water park. Uh, Disney Quest, I would probably do either later in the day, so if you have maybe, you go to Animal Kingdom until 5 o'clock, you can go to Disney Quest that evening. But I would try and spend a, at least a day at each of the other Disney theme parks. Wow, really? I, I'm I am so going to disagree with you on that. While you're you're very focused on Disney, I love Disney as well. The Wizarding World of Harry Potter, and I will say Harry Potter. Let me just get you the book. Let me. I'm just redoing my tweet. Let me redo my tweet. Becky Mankin hates Duffy (laughs) and Disney World. Okay. No, no, no. All right. Anyway, going back, it's it really is an awesome experience, Lou. I'm taking you. You and I are going to go. That's. You sound like Charlie Brown's teacher right now. Want, 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 want. That's all I hear. Putting it on the list, but for the moment, let me just work with me. Go with me, Anthony. That. It's possible to do the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, but what you would want to do is probably the same day. And you're going to still yell at me when I say this. It, you could do it the same day that you do Animal Kingdom. If you get to Wizarding World at opening, go back, enjoy those, and then that's the only thing you're going to do while you're there is just going to do that and then head to um, – or whatever park it is that you're, you're, your list of priorities is shortest on. So what we normally tell people that the key is – when you have a short stay and there's so much you want to do, there's just no way you can see everything in four days. You can't even see everything in seven days. You can't even really see everything in 10 days. So the key is to prioritize and plan. You may need to choose a couple of the parks for half day visits. And you can do that by selecting the attractions that are the absolute must do's, narrow down which parks you want to schedule for that half day. And then if you really want to try to fit, fit in, Let's let's say it together, Lou. Wizarding World of Harry Potter. 
then you can actually do that on one of the days. But you're also right that trying to fit in the water park may be a little difficult or Disney Quest. I would put those two on more towards the bottom of the list uh, rather than, than push out uh, one of the others. That's just my. I don't even know if you've been talking. But anyway, Anthony, here's, <laughs> here's my plan for you. So the first wow. day you get there, you go to Magic Kingdom from rope drop until the end because you'll get to experience the holiday decorations. Right. You'll get to experience uh, the the castle show, the, uh, the the dream along with Mickey, the castle projection show, the holiday uh-huh. lights as they light the castle up, the parade, everything else that snow on Main Street that embodies the holidays at Walt Disney World. On day, day two, you'll go over to Epcot Center. You'll enjoy all the attractions there. In the afternoon and evenings, you'll be able to wander the promenade of World Showcase, get to experience any and all of the holiday storytellers, <laughs> have a delicious meal at the restaurant of your choice anywhere around the world, and then enjoy candlelight processional and then holiday illuminations with Walt or Cronkite at the end. On day three, you can go over to Disney's Hollywood Studios and enjoy all that the park has to offer there, including some of their holiday offerings, including and especially the Osborne family spectacle of dancing lights. On day four, you'll get up, you'll get to Animal Kingdom first thing in the morning, you'll spend a full day enjoying, meandering, and exploring Disney's Animal Kingdom, and you'll finish it off at Disney Quest in downtown Disney and a meal at a place like Raglan Road, Paradiso 37, even the meatball bar over at Portobello's. You and your dad will hug and embrace because <laughs> you've created a lifetime of memories in just four days. You'll get on the awesome. plane arm in arm and we'll move however, on to your next question. However, I don't, even, if, I don't even know what you're saying. Listen, I don't even however, know you anymore. If, oh, man, this is so bad. You Let's ask the think. listeners, who, no, whose plan know, do you but, like better? Do you like wait, Becky's wait, wait, plan wait, wait, A? Wait, or, wait for a moment. They did not mention if they're staying on site or not, because if they're staying on site, they also have access to the extra magic hours, which then opens up much more of an opportunity, say, like on Friday when they have the late night hours at Epcot. You could definitely take advantage of those to hit a lot of the attractions and still have an opening in the early morning to go see Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Anthony, she hates Duffy. and. <laughs> But to the second part of your question hey, about Dining with an Imagineer, uh, I will tell you that I'm going to do a full review of Dining with an Imagineer soon. But what I can tell you is I hear a lot about this from listeners, uh, also on the forums over at WW Radio. I've seen a lot of trip reports, and I've heard nothing but great reviews. And for those of you who don't know about this, Dining with an Imagineer at Walt Disney World gives you a chance to meet up with an Imagineer for a four-course meal at one of two restaurants, uh, in in one in and one out of the parks. The first is over at the Brown Derby at Hollywood Studios, actually over in the Bamboo Room, which is sort of a, a separate room from the main dining room. The main room. And the second is the Flying Fish Cafe over at Disney's Boardwalk. It's a very small group. It's only up to 10 people. And it gives you a lot of really good one-on-one time with an Imagineer. Now, you don't get to choose your Imagineer. You don't know who the Imagineer is going to be beforehand. But... You'll get Imagineers from a variety of disciplines. And look, you want to be an Imagineer? This is your chance to sit down with them over a meal and talk to them. Hear about their personal journey. Talk about what it is that you want to do. What discipline in Imagineering you're thinking about going to. And, you know, obviously they can't sort of give you the roadmap. But talk to you about their experience and your experience. And it's an exp- it's something that you can't get any any place else, especially over at Wizarding World of Harry Blotter. But... It's um, it, it's sixty dollars and ninety nine cents for uh, guests ten and older. Again, it's not for um, younger kids. And again, tax and gratuities are added. Uh, I've never done it before. Definitely something on my to do list to do. But again, heard nothing but really, really good reviews, especially in how uh, open and welcoming the Imagineers have been. Many of whom sometimes continue on with uh, emails and, and conversations with guests even after the experience is over. My head is in my hands, really. Just on on the Imagineer part, absolutely. I've heard nothing but great things about it. I have not tried it myself, but we've had a lot of great feedback uh, about that it was so worth the the cost to to do it. So um, that's another thing on the list. There you go. And the Wizarding World, Harry Potter. Harry Blotter. Anyway, Shannon writes and says, Hey, Lou, we are visiting Walt Disney World soon with our soon-to-be seven-year-old We want to take a tour or special event when we're there. However, it seems most, if everything, is geared to older or teenage kids. We've participated in the scavenger hunt, and it's our very favorite. 
the Pirates and Pals voyage in the past two years. So we wanted to do something new that we, we think would be fun for her. She's also participated in the Pirate Adventure at the Grand Floridian and the Caribbean Beach Resorts. Do you have any suggestions? And while there's no lack of fun, we always like to have one extra adventure on the itinerary. We're visiting uh, later on this year, and it looks as though the Very Merry Christmas Party is not going to be on the calendar, so we're looking for your suggestions. Thanks for always letting this Disney geek geek know she isn't alone in her obsession. Shannon, uh, I I love the fact that you are already starting to try and uh, dig a little bit deeper, sort of uh, go sort of down deeper into those different layers of the onion uh, for your child. And again, you did mention that he or she uh, is is going to be seven years old. So that does restrict the number of backstage tours. Uh, and Disney does offer Keys to the Kingdom and, and uh, Backstage Magic, lots of other tours as well. But there are a few that you can go on that a seven-year-old can participate as well. Usually, uh, they have to be about 16 or older, especially for the ones that do go backstage. However, you can do... These are the two the two that I would probably recommend. The first would be uh, a fun, easy, simple one is the Behind the Seeds Tour over in Epcot at the Land Pavilion. It literally takes you into the greenhouse. It's a very interactive tour. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's educational, too. So if you're yanking her out of school, you don't feel as bad. But the one I think that you and she would probably really like is Disney's Family Magic Tour. That's daily right. at 10 a.m. It's a two-hour tour, so it's not a crazy amount of walking or too much time not spent on attractions if that's what you want to do. It's only $34. It's for ages three and up. And if you're a pass holder, AAA, DVC, Disney Visa, whatever, you can also get up to a 15% discount on that tour as well. And again, Becky, lots of great uh, reviews for the tour that I've seen on the forums, uh, on Twitter, and even from emails I get from listeners as well. Oh, yeah. And watching families in the park run around, it is it is so fun because they're searching for clues to uh, to go on these journeys and doing these tasks. And it is so fun watching them. I, I can't imagine it. It's one of those ones that so many families love. Yeah. And if anybody has taken the Family Magic Tour recently, please share your experiences. Again, come to the show notes for this week's show over at www.radio.com and you can post your review uh, of the Family Magic Tour in the comments section there. Moving on to a question from Laura. Uh, She says, hi, Lou. Uh, Hope your move went well this summer. You must be so happy to be closer to Walt Disney World. As a quick aside, I am. I do not miss the three and a half hour drive back and forth. But she says, you are an inspiration and I look forward to your show each and every week. I recently made my annual visit to the world and my family stayed at Port Orleans French Quarter. We loved it and the small size of the resort only made the experience more intimate. I have just one question. I remember you mentioning that French Quarter used to have a table service restaurant called Bon Famille's. I know that it closed a few years ago, but I was wondering where exactly it was located since it wasn't very obvious. Thanks so much for your help. Laura, sent from her iPod. Becky, I'm going to answer her question with a question for you. Oh, really? Who or what <laughs> was Bon Famille's named after? Uh, probably Bon Famille. Oh. <laughs> Uh, give see, me, give me, all right, I'll even, I'll even give you a clue. Now think about it. Think about the name. Think about the resort. Think about um, it's from a Disney film. Uh, let's see. You're googling. You're go- You're trying you're, to figure out how to spell Bon Famille, and you're googling. Or actually, the Aristocats. Yeah, well, that's nice that Google finally <laughs> returned that answer for you. But Google she was- is my friend. Madame Sorry. Bonfamille uh, was the owner of the, the French cats in the Aristocats. And they were, uh, if you remember from the film that you just Googled and probably have never seen, much like many of the Disney films, there was a, wow. remember the jazz band of cats? And the leader of that band was Scat Cat. And there's actually the, the Scat Cat Club over at Fort Orleans French Quarter was located right next to where Bonfamille's was. So to give you an idea, location-wise, it was located next to where Scat Cats was. I've learned something today. <laughs> the cool thing about Bon for Meals, and I, I, I obviously you, it sounds like you've never been there before, but there is an elaborate backstory to Port Orleans. And if you go back to a show, I think from a couple of years ago, we really talk about it in depth, but they really had this very charming menu. Uh, it wasn't just a simple sort of one-page front and back menu. On the front, there was actually a picture of a family, and 
inside the menu was like four pages long with a ton of so for breakfast they had a, a famous uh french toast like a cinnamon french toast but they had breakfast there they had skillets they had soups and salads and the entrees there was probably like eight or nine things on the entree they had an amazing jambalaya like they had a lot of really authentic French Creole. So they had like sea scallops and they had barbecued ribs and, and uh, like a spit roasted chicken. Really, really nice. And it was nice also too because it was a full service restaurant, but it closed about 11 years ago. It closed in August of 2000. So right now Boat Rights is the only full service restaurant uh, over at French Quarter, uh, over at, I'm sorry, uh, Riverside, not in French Quarter. As long as they still have beignets, I'm a happy gal. <laughs> sorry can't help it that's i mean every time i think about french quarter because uh, yeah unfortunately i was not able to um uh, to to check out this wonderful restaurant that you're talking about and it sounds like especially with the the detail and the story it, it would be fascinating and it's a bummer that they kind of that they got rid of it but my memories of food at french quarter are the beignets and i can't get away from that so i'm sorry it's doughy you, French sweet goodness with powdered <laughs> sugar. Come on. You would have liked this. They actually had some awesome desserts too. They had like a triple that they had a, a triple layer cake, which was just called chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Are you serious? And they had I'm I would not kid you. They had this <laughs> no. a Jackson Square brownie. And if you if you look, Jackson Square is the name of sort of the lobby area there. It was a double fudge brownie and it had chocolate sauce on it and yeah. Oh, that's just wrong. So what's the name right. of what's the name of the bar by the Dubloon Lagoon? One of the funniest name you know names of a of a bar. I have no idea. Marty Grogs. You get it like Marty Grogs. <laughs> <laughs> do you, you you order a green drink and you get beads? Is that you, how it works? You do. But I have to see oh, if okay. I can if I have a uh, a scan or a PDF of that old menu and I'll try and see if I can put it in this week's show notes on the www.radio.com. Four, four pages, huh? That's pretty cool. It, it was a huge, huge... And, and again, one of the pages was... Uh, but I, the two pages were breakfast menu. So, I mean, that's how big the it was. I mean, it was a huge menu. It wasn't just a couple of, of uh, things. And it was very... The, the food there was very much themed to the resort. So it had a lot of... Just like when you go out to to Disneyland and, and some of the restaurants there, uh, like mm-hmm. Ralph Brennan's Jazz Kitchen, this very much has that same kind of feel to it, that that New Orleans, uh, you know, square style feel to the food as well. And they closed it, why? Uh, they, um, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> All right, good. See, I, doesn't I, it feel fun to have some thrown right back I at I don't you? know, but, but the area is actually... It's still there. From what I understand, they actually do use it sometimes for meetings. I don't know if you can hmm. – I don't know if it's a special event space. I know some people did – and I think it's also um, I think it's also a test kitchen. I think they also do use it as a test ah, kitchen too. Ah, so. okay. Interesting. But yeah, I'll have to try and see if I can find the menu. Just like think of like andouille gumbo and, and Mardi Gras. Oh, crawfish <laughs> pasta. Food. Oysters. Crawfish? Biscuits and gravy. Ah, Biscuits and Ew. gravy. Really? Oh, uh, this is what I will tell you. This is you not, are not this, from the south. This, you no, are oh, clearly no. not from the south. No, all all the things you just mentioned, they're just things that aren't that aren't things that I would would not be first on my list. Jambalaya. I don't. I oh, just, are you I'm not a me? fan. I don't even. Know I'm you. not a I fan. I don't know you anymore. I'm moving on. <laughs> I'm going to. We have to move on because <laughs> all right, I, all right. I'm, I'm, my my brains are falling out of my head. Harry Potter. He, anyway, <laughs> every year, slowly but surely, this comes from Daniel Roberts. Every year, slowly but surely, Walt Disney World changes. So slowly, bit by bit, the classic attractions and our relations to them, through whether through memories or photos or nostalgia, fade just a little bit. I wonder if, along the lines of my question about a fifth park that you used on show 229, would a Disney Classics Park be a wonderfully awesome idea? I'm talking Toad, 20,000 Leagues, Meet Mr. Lincoln, Every classic attraction in one place, complete with classic Disney movies. I know, Becky, this has this does not resonate with you at all. You've never even heard of these films. Each really? land in the park could represent a decade in Walt's life and dreams, ending when Epcot opens. I'd love to hear you and Becky discuss this. Your loyal fan, 
Daniel Roberts. So his question basically, uh, you know, he's got a valid point. As time goes on and things change, we start to forget about some attractions uh, which disappeared over time or were retired in uh, for one reason or another. And mm-hmm. so his idea is a Disney Classics Park where you sort of bring back, if you could, sort of magically bring back the classic attractions in their former form. What do you think about that kind of an idea, a Disney okay. classics park. Intriguing, however, my Libra is going to really show here because I, while at first when I think about that, it sounds like, oh, that would be great because you just go to a place where all the things that everybody really wants to see and have protested over time to bring back would all be there. However, then the other side of the Libra takes over and says, you know what, though? And I, while the parks are always changing and 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 renewing themselves, which I, I think was the intention from Walt. Um, the one thing that I really do enjoy about the parks is having everything mixed in like that. Is that there's always something that appeals to everybody in the family when you do have the classics mixed in with the new things mixed in with, um, uh, with all the other attractions. So whether you're a six year old child or you're the 30 year old mom or you're the 65 year old grandparents, there's something there that's going to resonate with you when you have it mixed together. So while it sounds like a really cool thing, if I had a choice, I think I like everything mixed together. So, again, for a lot of us who are nostalgics, you say, awesome, you know, bring back, bring back all the classics. And some of them you say, yeah, Horizon, Toad, 20,000 Leagues. But... Think about it uh, on a much broader scale. And the question I would ask to Daniel and to people who are listening, because I, w- I want them to certainly weigh in on, on this kind of idea- concept, is mm-hmm. is nostalgia enough to bring in new guests? Because remember, this is a business. And if you're going to spend money, spend resources, use some of the land to bring in uh, a, a new theme park with old attractions... Will that bring in new business? Not just those of us who are like, oh, my God, I can't wait to ride Mr. Toad one more time. Is that going to make another family say, wow, we haven't been to Disney World in a long time. They're bringing back great, not that they've ever had, but they're bringing in Mr. Lincoln or they're bringing back World of Motion, whatever it is. Is it sustainable? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if a concept like that is actually sustainable over time. Because if you think about it, and it pains me to say this, uh, but we loved Horizons, and we look back fondly on Horizons and what it represented and the kind of attraction that it was. But if you think back to before Horizons closed, we were able to ride it a lot because it wasn't necessarily the busiest attraction in the park. And by that, I mean it was pretty much a walk-on. So before Horizons closed, that's maybe part of the reason why the death knell began, began to sound for some of these attractions is that they were not as popular, and I wonder if our nostalgia alone is enough to make them sustainable. You know, would you rather have Mr. Toad come back, or would you rather have Tron Land come Tron, back, yeah. or uh, you know, something new that is going to really resonate with, like you said, multiple generations? And I, I, I listen, I am a, I am the guy that wants Mr. Toad to come back. I loved Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. I loved the so non-traditional, happily ever after ending of getting hit by a train and going to Hades <laughs> and dying and, and then coming out into the Florida heat as if That's you really why were it's in Hades. one of Hades. my favorite rides. But, you have a but dark Lou, and, and twisty kind well, yeah, of way about but, you. But you can see it because you get on a plane and you come to California and you get to experience Mr. Toad. Exactly. And you get a, a version of the subs with the Nemo attraction out there. But, you know, yeah. Becky, I don't know. I, I don't really think that a classics park. And I, I but I, I, as much as I do like the one concept. aspect of what you said, sort of the different uh. decades in Walt's life. And I think that's what California Adventure, Adventure is going to do is sort of take uh, a, right. a look at Walt uh, at, at a different point in, in his life and the studio's back then but i don't know if and look I, i'd love the skyway to come back i'd like that 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 simple pleasure of riding over the twenty thousand leagues under the sea lagoon and that cast member at that 90 degree turn swinging your bucket around so you could make that <laughs> turn over right. the raceway into tomorrowland but i don't know i don't know if people who had never seen twenty thousand 000 Le- or uh, mr toad or horizons would go 
don't know. It's kind of outdated. It's kind of just simple little devil cardboard cutouts. And and again, I, I'm playing, pardon the pun, devil's advocate by saying that because I'd be like, yeah, 20,000 leagues, Mr. Toad, Horizons, bring them all back. Body wars, baby. But uh. you wonder uh, <laughs> how they might resonate with the mom, dad, two and a half kids that has never been to Walt Disney World before. Yeah, I totally agree. When you look at the business aspect of it, rather than just the uh, the, the fan aspect that I came at it with at the very beginning, it, it, I don't think it would fly. I, I don't think you would be able to make a, a good ROI out of that situation because, of course, like I, like we said, you could still go see some of these attractions or things that are near them at other parks, Disneyland in, in particular. But I, I just don't think that it would uh, it would do what they would need to to make shareholders happy. Because, of course, as the generations are, are coming up, they're, the, the kids are seeing new movies and they want to go see those attractions. I mean, look at when, when uh, Tangled hit and you had the, the girls who wanted to go see, um, see the characters from Tangled. They threw up a, uh, an attraction or a meet and greet, not an attraction, but a meet and greet, and that place was packed. And, of course, the, the parents were thrilled because they were able to share something that their, their kids were excited about. And I think that's what ultimately the Disney parks are all about our parents and children and, and grandparents all coming together and enjoying something together. And I don't think that uh, 20,000 Leagues or Meet Mr. Lincoln or, or even Toad is going to have anything for um, that's really going to resonate with the, the current five, six, seven-year-olds that the, the, the parents really want to connect with. Right. And I don't even think necessarily it's a technology thing either. Uh, I no. don't think because classic dark rides – still do very well in both Disneyland, mm-hmm. Walt Disney World. Uh, unless other you're the limo ride. <laughs> it's, unless you're Superstar Limo or, yeah. or Rocket Rock. And yeah. Horizons was sort of very forward thinking and could, could certainly um, still appeal to people. But I think it's, it's a it, look, what makes an attraction great, what makes an attraction sustainable is storytelling. Story. Mm-hmm. Look, at, look at the Haunted Mansion, which for nearly 40 years remained almost identical to the way it was opening day. Same thing with Pirates of the Caribbean. That story, those characters, the technology had remained pretty much the same. Uh, I think, again, there would be a, a, a rel- and again, it's a relatively small section of the guest population that visits Walt Disney World every year that would love to see those and be like, oh, man, one more ride on, on 20,000 Leagues. But yeah. maybe that's all it would be, it would be one more ride, not we need to go spend two days in classics land or okay. whatever you would call it i have a happy medium why don't they come up with well you know they they did the uh the disneyland connect game why don't they do a game that is all the classic rides that you can go through well i will tell you this and i will actually put some links in the show notes there are some people out there who are extremely passionate about these classic attractions and, mm-hmm. uh, and passionate about the fact that they're gone many people in the social spaces lament and talk about the old Epcot Center or things that were supposed to be or never getting a chance to experience. And some people have gone so far as to recreate those attractions in computer, in digital format. They've done ride-throughs, virtual ride-throughs where they're making a, a 3D model of things like Horizons and Mr. Toads. There's extensive websites about 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And I'll put some of those links in there because these guys love these attractions so much that they want to not only keep that experience going for themselves, but let others who never got a chance to see it do so beyond more than the grainy eight millimeter movies without sound that were been transferred to YouTube. And I applaud these guys for the work and the time that they've spent doing it. And forgive me that I don't know their uh, exact names off the top of my head. I know, I think it's one's Horizons Resurrected. Uh, I don't remember the Mr. Toad one, but again, I will, uh, I'll link to him again in the, sh- in the show notes if you want a chance to experience it through their eyes with the projects that they have going online. Well, I'm really intrigued about Horizons because you've sp- spoken so highly of that ride for so long uh, the attraction i've never been on it or have never seen it so that's going to be one of those things that i'm going to go seek out as soon as you give me the link (laughs) and look and again clearly there is an interest in that because if you look at merchandise that's come out uh look at some Mm -hmm. of the park stars vinylations the horizons robot we saw that in the case and i was like this is awesome so people in the design groups and imaginings love those as well too we sort of miss the fact that they were gone and they just sort of live on in our memories but again 
For those of you who are listening, I would love for you to weigh in on your thoughts about a Disney Classics Park. Is it a great idea? Could it really work? Uh, do you have sort of a, a variation that you think could work? Somehow bringing those experiences back, especially for those who hadn't had a chance to see them or remember them like we do from growing up in our childhood. Please come by this week's show notes over at WDWRadio.com. Leave your comments there or on Twitter or on Facebook or Google+. We'll keep this conversation going. You know I would love to hear from you. And again, like I said at the beginning, I want to keep this a two-way conversation. I also want to thank once again Becky Mankin from MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. You can visit them over at MouseFanTravel.com. And Becky, I say this sincerely all the time. What I love about you guys is, and the reason why I use you personally is not just because of the pricing and the discounts and, and the magic you guys are able to do, but the way that your agents are, the service that you guys give, makes me feel like I am their one and only client and I am the most special person. And that is sort of that extension of that Disney magic, that Disney experience. So I applaud and thank you for that. And thank you for joining me on the show once again. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. And my team does as well. They are fantastic. So I'm very, very proud of them. And, you know, this, at least I have a great idea for a gift for you from today's show. Yeah. Which is what? I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to bring you a few of the Harry Potter movies so you can see them before we go. So you understand what you're actually saying, because with a little background. I thought you were going to go out and be like, you know what? I'm going to buy you a Horizons (laughs) ride vehicle. I'm going to bring you a doom (laughs) buggy. For your house, I'm going no. to get you one of those little devil Mr. Toad cardboard no. cutouts from the See, attraction. You you need a wand theme and a cape. Theme park ephemera. Theme. I'm I love seeing you. Theme park mer- merchandise that's been in the Disney theme parks does, is what is does my. Does the word does the word Slytherin mean anything to you, just saying? I'm, I'm literally. I wish was, I'm rubbing my head. I'm rubbing my temples <laughs> because my brain hurts so much. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have a great time there. WDW uh, the, stands have, for Walt Disney World. We are gonna have a scene. great time. Butterbeer. You New fantasy. Love butterbeer. New fantasy. Butterbeer. <laughs> Seven Dwarves Gringotts. Mine Coaster. Gringotts. I got oh, two words for you, sister. Avatar I, Land. Hold on. Do you have pro- any problem with spiders? You okay with spiders? I love Spider Man. Spider Man. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What? Yeah. Spiders. I'm just so wondering, it, do you have a fear of spiders or heights or flying on a broom? Just seven Dwarfs Mine Coaster. Uh-huh. <laughs> Bring back Horizons. Woo! This Come is going to be fun. Get a wand. Get a wand. You're going to need it. Get a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Butterbeer. Just saying. Sangria at Tortuga Tavern. <laughs> yes, Frozen. Tavern. Frozen Butterbeer. Two words for you, sister. Chocolate Dole frogs. Whip. Dull whip. <laughs> Chocolate frog. Whip it good. <laughs> we can go on for hours. You realize that, don't That's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks so much for taking the time and tuning in this and every week. Please come by the website at wdwradio.com. There you can comment on the show notes, check out our blog, discussion forums, videos, and lots more. You can call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WDW1 to be heard on the air. Or you can email me your questions at lou at wdwradio.com. Every Wednesday night, join us live for our video broadcast and chat over at www.radiolive.com. Be part of the conversation. And speaking about joining us live, if you're going to be down in Walt Disney World during Marathon Weekend, we have a number of meets and events going on. You can check out those over at DisneyMeets.com. Our next meet of the month is going to be Saturday, January 7th, after the half marathon in the Magic Kingdom at the Plaza Rose Garden. Again, you can visit our running page or DisneyMeets.com for more information. Thanks again to Becky and her team over at Mouse Fan Travel. They are my recommended travel provider, AllStarVacationHomes.com has two-bedroom condos up to seven-bedroom homes and lots more within just a couple of miles of Walt Disney World. And the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin over at SwanandDolphin.com has 17 restaurants and lounges, the Heavenly Beds, Mandara Spa, and lots more. Again, you can visit them over at SwanandDolphin.com. And while today is Christmas, please remember it's not about a single day or a holiday, but the spirit of the season. And no matter what or how you celebrate, I hope that you are spending time and making lasting memories with those that you love and that feeling of joy and peace and happiness that you have lasts not just during the holidays, but each and every day. And most importantly, I need to thank you 
for giving me the greatest gift this year, which has been the gift of your friendship. I mean it sincerely when I say that when I think about the blessings I've received this year and every day, the support and the friendship that you've extended to me, whether in person, via email, or otherwise, means more to me than you know. And being able to share my love of Disney with you in so many different ways is something I am grateful for each and every day. So thank you so much. Again, as always, my friends, if you like the show, all I ask is that you please help spread the word to your friends and your family. Let others know about it. Tweet out that you're listening. Share the link on Facebook and Google+. And please come by. It would be really helpful and appreciated if you rate and review the show over in iTunes. And as always, remember, especially as we start looking forward to 2012 and beyond, that there is no time like right now. Don't wait for tomorrow to start pursuing something you are passionate about and do something you love each and every day. I promise it will make you a happier and more positive person. And when you do, always keep moving forward. Again, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and my sincerest thanks to all of you for taking the time and tuning in. So until next time, have a great week, everybody. See you. Hey, Lou, this is Jamie from Chicago. Just calling today. Today's Christmas. Calling to wish you, Deanna, and the kids a very Merry Christmas. I've also got my mom and Kayla with me, and they wanted to say Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you. All right, Lou, Deanna, Nicholas, and Marion, have a great day. Hope your Christmas is magical. I know we're getting ready to go and watch the Disney parade right now at my sister's house, so... Have a great day. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Hey, Lou. It's Emma calling from a very cold but sunny UK here. I just wanted to wish you and all your listeners a very Merry Christmas and thank you for bringing Disney into our lives again this year. Um, it's been a brilliant 2011. I've made some wonderful new friends this year because of WDW Radio and I can't wait to see what 2012 brings. Thanks again for everything you do. And uh, see ya. Hello, everyone. It's Darlene from West Seneca, New York. I hope you're all having a happy holiday season. And I hope everyone has a wonderful new year. Uh, stay positive, as Lou always says. I know I am. And I want to wish everybody from Keith, myself, Alicia, Chip, and Cogsworth, a very happy, healthy new year. Um, hope to see you all real soon and talk to you later. Bye. Hey, Lou. Jen Tremley from Bristol, Connecticut. Just wanted to call in and say hi. Just finished uh, this week's uh, show, show 253, which was your live restaurant review at the Plaza Restaurant. Um, I also commented on the website uh, under the show notes for this week uh, for and about the Plaza. Um, it was nice to finally see you do a live restaurant review on this restaurant. It is extremely overlooked. Um, it is one of one of my favorites um, uh, as far as table service uh, for the Magic Kingdom, since there isn't much in the way of table service um, at the Magic Kingdom. Um, we've used the plaza, or we've eaten at the plaza um, many, many times. It's uh, very, you know, small, quaint, um, you know, good comfort food, uh, good variety, uh, very economical, very big portions for the amount of money that you're paying. Um, pretty much, you know, everything that you said while you were reviewing the restaurant, um, it, it is absolutely true. Um, I've eaten there several, several times. Um, a lot of times people do just walk right by it. They think it's part of the uh, ice cream parlor or uh, they don't know that it's a little table service restaurant. So um, in my experience, um, we've used or we've eaten there on uh, nights that we've done the Halloween party um, versus trying to uh, get into the Liberty Tree or Tony's. Um, both of those are great as well, uh, but sometimes we'll have a really, we would make an ADR for a really, really late lunch um, at the plaza, say around 4, maybe 4.30, whatever the latest serving was for lunch, and then this way we were already, you know, already had our dinner, um, and we were able to start the, you know, enjoying the, the Halloween party, so that place does work very well uh, with the Halloween party as well as I'm assuming it would with the Christmas party. Um I just wanted to wish everybody, you, your family, and all the uh, WDW radio listeners out there a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Um, I wish everyone the best, um, and uh, I wish I was able to uh, enjoy the uh, the holidays down at Disney this time of year. I've never been down there it's yet for me, um, but my whole tree is decorated Disney, and uh, I have some cool Disney decorations around the house that kind of, 
you know, keep me in that uh, Disney Christmas mood. Um, but one of these days, um, I will hopefully get down there for Christmas time and be able to see it all lit up. Um, and I'm also excited. I just deposited last week on a Disney cruise on the Fantasy 2012 in September, seven day. Uh, Eastern Caribbean, so that's a first for me too. Never been on a Disney cruise, and I'm totally looking forward to uh, getting onto the new ship, the Fantasy. So I got a lot coming up for next year. We're also going to try to squeeze in a four-day Disney trip on the on the front end of that cruise trip to make it just one heck of a Disney vacation. So anyway, again, happy holidays to everybody, uh, you and your family, as well as the WDW uh, radio listeners. And I hope you guys have a wonderful week and a great holiday. Talk to you later. Hey, Lou. This is Marissa. Um, we're driving to Florida. We're through Georgia. So, uh, almost to Disney. So, I just want to say hi. So, from the car. Say hello. Hi, Lou. Say hi, Quentin. 